Renovating a large triple expansion model steam engine, this is part two, making a flywheel for the engine. It's going to be very difficult to get this engine working if I cannot turn over the crankshaft. The crankshaft appears rather stiff. I would assume that it's been manufactured from one piece, not a built up one like on the other video I've been showing. This is a real deal. In this clip, I'm taking some micrometer readings from the end of the crankshaft where I want to put the flywheel. The flywheel can't be very big because there is insufficient clearance from the centre of the crankshaft down onto the baseboard. This engine was built by someone quite well known. When I googled the name Sir Charles Inglis, I got quite a lot of information and it appears that he was quite well known in the world of engineering. After the first video, a previous owner of the engine got in touch and said that it spent most of its life in an unfinished state in a glass case at Cambridge University in England. Just in case you wonder what I'm doing on the lathe at the moment, I'm machining a plug gauge, because very shortly I will be machining a flywheel. And the hole in the centre of the flywheel needs to be very accurate. As you can see by the video, I keep stopping the lathe and taking micrometer readings. This is because I need to step this part, owing to the engine's crankshaft being very slightly tapered. It measures just a tiny bit less at the outer edge than it does nearer the main bearings. The problem of course is going to be that if I bore this hole in the centre of the flywheel to suit the diameter of the crankshaft nearer the main bearings, then the front of it is going to rattle about and I don't want that to happen. So what I'm going to attempt to do is taper the hole in the flywheel to fit this very very shallow taper on the crankshaft. This taper is not to be confused with the standard taper that you would get on say a petrol engine flywheel and the flywheel or the magneto cover presses onto this taper and is held on with a bolt. That would be fine. But the taper on the crankshaft of this engine is not that kind of taper. I really am expecting to find quite a few anomalies with this engine. There has to be a reason why it's never really been finished. This is going to be an interesting series. I think I'm going to be taxed to the limit on this in certain areas. That's my plug gauge made. On to the next part. These wheel castings were some really obscure wheel castings that I got from Blackgate's Engineering. I don't know what they're for, but they were the right size to machine down for this engine. I'd like to thank Matt who works at Blackgate's Engineering for giving them to me. Machining these castings is a fairly simple job. I've already covered machining a flywheel in an earlier video, so you might like to take a look at that one. It's part of the Model Engineering for Beginners playlist. There is of course a comprehensive playlist section on this channel, so if you want to know what's in the series and what the series are all about, then you need to look at the playlists. Back to the video, I have run into a problem. This is a four-jaw self-centering chuck. It's quite a big chuck because the lathe is very heavy duty, but there is not a great deal of centre height and it's not a gap bed lathe. And when I wind the jaws out to clamp the wheel, they foul the bed. So I'm going to change the jaws for the spare set that I have. These are different jaws to the originals if you want to compare. They pull from the outside in. So hopefully with these jaws fitted, the chuck should hold the casting perfectly. And by the way, just like a three jaw chuck, these jaws are numbered one, two, three, four, and they have to be fitted into the chuck in the sequence one, two, three, four. Otherwise the jaws will not close properly. And I've been really lucky with this one. This wheel is a very odd size. But luckily the outermost jaws of the chuck Clamp it fine. And now I can start the machining process. I'm going to start off by machining the centre part of the flywheel. After an exploratory cut to make sure that the casting isn't chilled, which of course it isn't, now I know that the casting is okay and it's fairly well lined up, it's good enough, I'm using a knife tool to take a facing cut across the front of the casting. Some of the practices used in a home workshop differ considerably from methods used in industry. I am referring to speeds and feeds. To confuse the matter, this video is currently speeded up. To cut cast iron in a home workshop at this speed would generally be problematic. So when cutting cast iron, find a speed and feed that suits your lathe. If you have a very small hobby lathe, it really is going to chatter. And it's the chatter sound that gives you the clue that things are not right. Although you can't see it because of the camera angle, I'm using a special cut down parting tool to machine this part of the flywheel. 
and when it gets to the outer edge, it chatters considerably. I even reground the tool to a sharper point, but it still squeaks a bit on the inside edge of the outer part of the flywheel. Most of this squeaking is taking place because the tool area is too large. If I slow down the actual speed of the lathe, it should go away. But for the purpose of the video, I'm going to carry on. And as you can see from this clip, I'm machining the center boss, giving it a bit of a clean up. And now I'm removing the sharp edges from both the inside edge of the outer part of the flywheel and the outside edge of the inner part of the flywheel. It's absolutely essential to remove any sharp edges from pieces of metal that you've machined. Because if you're going to handle these pieces of metal and you don't remove the sharp edges, then you will cut yourself quite badly. With the sharp edges removed, I'm now centre drilling the middle of the flywheel. You must always use a centre drill first because it doesn't wander about. If you try going in straight away with a twist drill, it will wander all over the place and possibly break. And talking about twist drills, that's the next operation. You can see how the centre hole pulls the twist drill into line. And don't forget, in exactly the same way as I talked about speeds and feeds when using a cutting tool in the lathe, remember that a twist drill is also a cutting tool. It's stationary, not like in a drill where it spins. The drill is stationary, the work revolves. But it's still a cutting tool, so if you go too fast, things are going to go wrong. And also, if it's a high-speed steel twist drill, it will get very blunt very quickly if you go too fast. The outer part of cast iron is very rough. There are generally sand castings, and there will be particles of sand in the skin. I call it a skin, it's not really a skin, it's the outer part of the casting. So my recommendation when machining cast iron is to make sure that the first cut gets under the skin, down to clean metal. This can be difficult if you only have a small lathe, but with a very sharp cutting tool, it's generally possible. I've engaged back gear, which slows the lathe down, and I'm using a reamer to enlarge the hole. But even after using this reamer, the hole will still be undersized, because I do not have a correct size drill, and I also do not have a correct size reamer for the diameter of the crankshaft. It's time to use the plug gauge and see what happens. As I mentioned earlier, the crankshaft on this engine is very slightly tapered. That's why I stepped the plug gauge. And the good news is, the step part of the plug gauge goes into the hole, which is just what I wanted. So now I can take the wheel out of the large lathe, and this clip shows the flywheel fitted into the three-jaw chuck of my small Boxford lathe. And with the back gear engaged to slow down the lathe spindle, and therefore the speed of rotation of the work, I'm taking a rough cut to get through the outer skin of the cast iron. The Boxford has no problem taking cuts of this depth. The tool is a carbide tip tool, so it's not going to blunt too easily, and it's cutting fine. Often the sound that comes from the piece of metal being cut tells you that the speed and feed is correct. It's a good idea to put some support at the back of a casting when it's just held lightly in a three-jaw chuck, and this is a good tip. I'm using a piece of mahogany, and this is pressed against the back of the casting using a live center. I can't use the live center directly in the hole because the hole in the flywheel casting is too big for the live center. By doing this, I can take much deeper cuts and put more pressure on the casting. And this lessens the risk of the casting coming loose and falling out of the chuck, which would be disastrous at this stage. You can see from this clip that the chuck jaws are only clamping onto the central register, which is not exactly big. This flywheel will be finally finished on a mandrel, and I will also show you how to make the mandrel to do this. And that's why I'm taking the time at this stage to remove the bulk of the metal, so that there's less to do when it's on the mandrel. To mention once again that to save time on the video, quite a lot of this footage of lathe operations is speeded up. I've temporarily removed the piece of hardwood, because I'm going to face the flywheel now, and as I've got the camera zoomed in quite closely, you can see the depth of cut that I'm taking. Just enough to get through all the shale and sand that's on the outside edge of the casting. After which I replace the piece of mahogany and the life centre that holds it in place. And here I'm taking a very fine finishing cut along the outside edge of the flywheel. The video is not speeded up. This is going a little faster than it should be. But as you can see... I'm getting a much shinier finish on the flywheel. This is bad practice really, because what's going to happen when I look at it, 
it will be slightly chattery, but these tiny marks can be easily removed with some coarse sandpaper. While the flywheel was spinning in the lathe at this speed, I used a file to clean up the outer edges to remove any possibility of a sharp edge, and then I fitted it to the engine. This is as far as the flywheel will actually push onto the engine at the moment. Experts, please look away now and don't bother contacting me to tell me that I'm doing it wrong. I'm just using a piece of rolled up sandpaper to bell mouth the flywheel slightly. And here's a good tip. Whenever you're doing a job like this, using sandpaper or any handheld abrasive near the chuck or the spinning piece of work, always hold it very lightly between your fingers. That way if the work grabs the sandpaper, it just pulls it out of your fingers and doesn't pull you into the chuck. And after very little work with the sandpaper, the flywheel now goes slightly further onto the crankshaft. It needs to go nearly all the way to the bed casting. But I can't do this until I've put it on the mandrel to finish the other side of the flywheel and check the general concentricity. Machining cast iron is quite an enjoyable process if you're into that kind of thing. A flywheel of this size should be keyed to the crankshaft, but because of the historical aspect of this engine, and the fact that it's always going to live in a glass case and not do any real work, I am not prepared to remove the crankshaft and machine keyways in it. As far as I'm concerned, especially with this engine, it's going to be a very sympathetic restoration. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.